to the substrate of the matter, as though materials could become machines, but machines could become materials, but perhaps a new kind of machine, um, an emotive machine, or what I would like to call an emotive matter. And what I mean by emotive matter is development of bio-inspired material systems, which is able to address psychosocial issues such as emotion, bodily perception, or social interactions. And I'm going to unpack this more during my talk. Um, I'm inspired by nature, especially with sea creatures, um, not only in terms of their complexity of forms and morphology, which is absolutely amazing and mesmerizing to, to, to observe, but also in terms of um, their um, sensing and intelligence capability in responding to their uh, surrounding environments. I'm particularly interested to see how materials of the environments could become intelligent and um, with a lifelike matter, manner respond to their surrounding environment. So I have started exploring these ideas um, from series of projects and prototypes um, ranging uh, from uh, a scale of and the world of um, uh, human scale and the world of variables and the world of variable computings all the way to architectural scale. Um, in my design research, I'm really interested to see how materials of the environments could become active and dynamic and reconfigurable, and how, for instance, our architectural spaces could become soft um, and uh, changes their shape in responding to, to, the, to the users. And um, I started building series of, when I started doing this type of work, I started uh, building series of interactive installations um, in terms of uh, walls and ceilings um, that they're robotic and they're augmented with sensory systems that allow this type of um, interactions. For instance, um, for instance, I made a wall that responds to um, hand gestures of the users. Um, in this case, um, I've been really fascinated by the idea of natural interaction with the built environments. We use our hands for various um, uh, communication purposes, either through communicating with our devices, such as tapping or swiping or zooming, or even for communication between humans. We use our hand for um, various types of communication. So this work really started looking at how we can use this gestural um, language as a way of communicating with architectural space. Um, so you can have series of um, behaviors such as uh, swiping or moving your hand from right to left and develop series of different type of behaviors on the, on the uh, surface of the, the wall. You can imagine that you go back home and you're just uh, lying down on your couch and changing the shape of your room. That was sort of the impulse behind um, this type of work. But soon I realized that if you do this type of interaction, you, you kind of have to stay in a certain location in order to interact with the surface of the wall. Um, so I've been really wondering how we could actually not just stay in one space, uh, one, one place in this space, but actually freely move in the entire space. So this is an interactive ceiling installation, which um, uh, respond to the activities of the people underneath ceiling. Um, in this case, there's a Kinect motion capture camera that um, track activity, the number of the people underneath the ceiling, and uh, according to those information, the shape of the environment change accordingly. This was a research collaboration between a steel case company when I was uh, at USC and, and Mobile and Environmental Media Lab. Um, one of the things about this project was really kind of exploring how, um, how could we develop a sort of reciprocal uh, relationship, a sort of two-way interaction between the human body and the built environment. But 
these ideas didn't just stay in the world of architecture. I was really fascinated by how these technologies could be populated around the human body and, and provide new type of affordances. Um, at, after all, uh, we are living in the world that we are already natural born cyborg as Andy Clark said. So I've been really fascinated uh, by this idea of extended mind in which um, our mind could be extended through um, technological means around our body. So this project um, really uh, tried to address uh, this question. Um, uh, this is a neuromorphic helmet that responds to the brain activity of the wearer. So it has series of, um, it has an EEG sensor, which is a brain computer interface technology that allows um, to, allows, allows um, processing of the information related to the brain activity of the wearer, those information uh, processed in using microcontroller and then sent back to the movement of uh, the helmet. So the more you think more or your attention level goes or your attention level goes higher, the helmet uh, opens up. Um, and the more your attention level goes down, the helmet closes down and creates a cocoon around your head. One of the idea behind this project is really looking at how we could blur the boundaries of our body especially if you can control uh, an object outside our body, could we claim that that object um, is part of our body? Um, this was uh, one of the early projects that uh, I used a 3D printing, like advanced 3D printing technology for fabrication of a wearable piece. And as soon I realized that as I was working more with this technology, I realized there is a lot of architects in the field that they're using this technology for producing um, either object size or variable size um, uh, objects. Um, so um, we um, co-edited an issue of architectural design on, on this matter in which um, we featured a series of groundbreaking work such as the work of um, Neri Oxman, um, uh, Nervous System, Francis Pitanti, Nicola Cassis, all were trained as an architect, but their skill sets was allowing them to sort of work and use this architectural education in other, other uh, scales. And what we call this, we say that this is not necessarily not architecture, but what we call this, this is a form of body architecture. It really applying the skill sets and knowledge of architecture um, uh, in different realms. So part of my uh, work um, is looking at new material development. I look at variety of computational systems um, and uh, robotic fabrication for producing novel materials, which are able to develop and demonstrate um, dynamic behavior. Uh, these materials um, could uh, change shape and they can change their properties, their porosity, their density. And computationally, we are able to control um, various information related to composition of these materials. So, um, and then the other part of this type of work is really looking at variety of uh, um, actuation systems, such as use of a smart material, shape memory alloy, or a soft robotics, um, or in fact, some conventional means, um, such as motors or any type of um, actuation systems. So it's really looking at this intersection of new material developments and robotic to develop materials which are um, dynamic and reconfigurable and able to show this sort of um, living uh, qualities. In this um, type of uh, material developments, I'm extremely inspired by various type of skin system, such as scales, feathers, hair, 
And um, a lot of uh, the work that I've done, uh, it addressed that how we could sort of understand this type of morphological and complex morphological uh, principles of this type of systems. For instance, um, I've been really fascinated by um, a fish scale system. And I was reading an article in which it was saying that um, the body of the fish, uh, the scale system is um, quite a hard material. It's a very rigid, solid material. But in a microstructure, because this is located on semi-flexible mesh system, it allows the entire body of the fish to, to bend and flex in different direction. So this type of uh, finding is really fascinating for me, but also allows me to think about uh, use of computation for producing system that can demonstrate similar behaviors. So these are some of the prototypes that shows that for instance, um, where I'm holding the materials, uh, the material is hard, but gradually the material gets soft uh, in the space in between. Um, Although this is basically a prototype that it was printed um, uh, just at once, and there is no assembly in such a such a uh, prototype. So it uses a multi-material 3D printing and allow for controlling material properties in a given point. And and these are some of the other studies of um, such um, such systems. Um, in all the previous examples that I showed, uh, most of them, uh, the, the, the 3D printing that I used, it was a very um, expensive, very advanced uh, quarter million dollar machine that allows this type of advanced multi-material 3D printing. But I was really interested to also explore what if we don't have access to such um, uh, technology? How could we actually use um, just one material most uh, materials that um, is it more accessible for everyone to use in order to develop materials which still shows flexibility and resilience um, uh, and movement. So part of my research, it looks at material geometries um, instead of material properties. So we just use one material property, but through the geometrical feature, we can allow for um, different uh, type of behavior. And uh, through a research project uh, that I was actually collaborating with a fashion designer, Pauline Van Dongen uh, from Nieder Netherlands, um, we realized that we were at the time using a very, um, uh, a very rigid um, and, and at the same time very much, uh, um, uh, it was very, the material that we were using at the time, it was very easy to break. What we realized is that if we print this material in a form of a spiral, the material starts to show uh, extremely flexible behavior. And uh, so it doesn't matter if the material properties is still, uh, you can actually, is still uh, very fragile, you can still print it in a form of a spiral or a coil, and that would allow um, behavior, behavior like this one's, uh, like movement and flexibility. So we started cataloging um, uh, these type of um, uh, forms, but also the expressions, various expressions that we could explore through um, such uh, morphologies. So just to summarize um, in my research into uh, material uh, developments, I look at morphology, which is related to forms and shapes. And in that I'm looking at both material properties as well as the geometrical feature. On the other hand, I'm looking at behaviors such as dynamic behavior of natural system. And in that I'm looking at sensing, encoding, responding um, uh, behaviors. Um, to my mind, um, integration of um, emerging technologies into the environment shouldn't be just seen as a way of uh, sort of as an end itself, but it should be as a way of addressing larger psychosocial issues. Um, in this um, way, I, one of my work, Crest of the Gaze, um, is a piece that responds to uh, a gaze of onlooker. Uh, so it's really trying to kind of uh, engages with a broader gender question, such as let's say male gaze on a female body. So this is a 3D printed cape um, that is equipped with a facial tracking camera and the camera can detect onlookers 
gender gaze as well as um, yeah, age, gender, and, 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 and gaze. And based on where the onlooker is looking, the garment moves accordingly. Onlooker, um, if you're the wearer, you know which part of your body is being looked at, and if you're onlooker, you know that um, your action is being noticed. And, and I would argue that such um, systems could change the social interaction because your next action would be completely different. Um, this project um, got many media attention, which was kind of out of hand, and it was really fascinating to observe. But as a designer, it was very interesting for me because I realized that I touch up on something which was culturally and historically was very sensitive. Um, and I think from that perspective, um, for me, the role of the designer is less about sort of mass production, but really creating awareness or creating conversation around issues that um, they're critical. The other part of my research uh, looks at um, sensor technologies. I look at variety of um, bio um, metric and inform sensor technologies such as BCI, EEG technology that tracks brain activities or various type of computer vision technology that allow us to see bodily movement, hand movement, but also facial expressions, um, uh, emotional expressions, gaze movement um, or eye movement tracking uh, technologies. So part of this type of uh, research is really, or, or design is looking at how we could um, look at um, human body as a, a place that there is so much information, so much physiological responses that is um, produced and, and this information could be measured um, through various type of sensor technology. So I'm very fascinated by this notion of, um, by the research by um, Affective Computing Group um, run by Rose Picards from MIT um, Media Lab, where they believe that there are sort of affective information from the human body that we can detect, measure, and allow the machine to understand um, the emotional states of the, the users. But then the question that sort of came up for me was, can we say that can computers have emotion? I mean, I understand that this is a big philosophical question um, and obviously maybe probably not, um, but we can say that machines could simulate um, emotions. But I also um, did a lot of uh, research and at the time uh, of my PhD at USC, I was sitting even in computer science um, courses on affective computing um, to really understand what is emotion and what is affect. Um, I agree with neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux who thinks that emotion could be sort of seen as this survival mechanism that could be um, uh, a key role for survival of both human and other, other species, other animals. Um, and I think um, when you look at, for instance, different species such as mice, cats, um, they bristle their, their fears as a, as a way of intimidation or as a defense mechanism. So um, I've been wondering, for instance, could our garment, um, could our wearable become uh, a way that um, it can respond uh, to uh, emotional information of the surrounding environment in a similar way. So this piece um, is a soft robotic um, wearable called Opal that um, respond to emotional expressions of the people around. 
So it has a facial tracking um, uh, inside the dress and it can track the, the basic emotional expressions such as happiness, sadness, surprise, anger, and, and, and neutral uh, from the people around. And then um, the first aspect was uh, we can actually detect this information, but also how could we develop different type of behaviors, different uh, kind of um, uh, dynamic behavior according to different type of um, detected emotions. So uh, in this, I'm really looking at a variety of um, uh, pneumatic systems. Uh, I have collaborated with my dear friend, um, mechanical and electrical engineer, Paolo Salvagion, in which we developed a very compact system that is wearable because um, uh, most of pneumatic systems, um, they require very chunky, extremely big equipments. But the question was, how could we actually make this available? How could we make this minimized to a very small um, uh, components? So on the right-hand side, you're seeing uh, a CO2 capsule, just 16. These are the CO2 capsule that they basically exist in any um, life jacket, jackets. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing the custom-made uh, electric boards for controlling the pneumatic system so they can control the speed and um, movement of um, the pneumatic systems. This is, um, this is the garment um, um, and uh, the location of the hair or the fiber optics that they're embedded inside the silicon. Um, you can see that some areas are denser, some areas that they're, they're sort of more open in terms of distribution of the hair. And this information was based on a study of the human body According to, according to surface analysis of the, the, the body architecture, we decided on the density as well as the height and distribution of the, the fibers. Um, and um, the production of this piece was quite um, labor intensive. Um, um, and um, it was really fascinating. I had a number of uh, undergrad students uh, at USC at the time and they helped, but you can see that it was very surgical operation almost. So we had to place all the fibers and then after that we pour the silicone and then we peel off the surface. It really um, felt like a surgical operation. But at the same time, it, it did, um, it does uh, feel, uh, feel like a actual skin almost like a second skin. project was um, a lot of people who suffer from a certain type of autism they they might look at you they might realize that you have some level of some some emotions on your face but they might have difficulties understanding that um, what is that emotion um, so this type of um, smart um, variables could probably help them to um, detect and, and blend in uh, with their surrounding social context Thinking more about um, the, the world of um, affective computing and emotional computing, I've been approached by, I actually uh, run two, two uh, set, sets of workshops for Adidas, um, both in their headquarters in, in Germany, as well as the one up in Portland. 
Um, and after one of my uh, talk, uh, one of the people from uh, one of the group came up to me and they were really interested to address how could we uh, think about this notion of affective computing in the context of developing a new customer experience. Um, especially, um, uh, so in this case, it was um, uh, kind of engaging with um, customers that they're going to see a, a new concept through in this case. So, um, and, and the question that um, I was really interested to explore myself was if we can detect uh, specific users, um, but also their emotional expression, expressions, how could we create an engaging experience? How could we, if we know they're, when they're happy, if we know when they're sad or when they're surprised, how could we develop, use this as a sort of um, in, uh, interaction design uh, principle for, for developing a more engaging experience? Um, the production of this piece um, was uh, consist of um, acrylic uh, box or, or a sphere, and that it was consist of series of pentagon and hexagons, um, and then populated with series of acrylic tube. Um, each of the components was uh, very robotically fabricated, and then after um, all the pieces were produced, um, they were um, sort of uh, assembled together using a series of nuts and um, screws. Inside each of the components, uh, there were a series of LED uh, strips that uh, could eliminate the, the piece from inside out. And inside the piece, there was, uh, there was a concept shoe located on the uh, sort of uh, motor system that it can rotate in various direction but also there was a camera that was able to track uh, emotional expressions of the people who are standing in front of the piece. So really thinking about the interaction design of this piece, it was uh, the intention was to think about interaction design as a character design. Like how could we give this object a character? How could we make this um, a sort of give it a persona? Uh, so if um, no one is in front of in front of the piece, uh, the piece goes to sort of um, a sleeping mode, as though it's dreaming. As you get closer to the piece, um, then if you don't have any emotional expression in your face, um, it has a different behavior than, for instance, when um, you're smiling or when you're frowning or when you're surprised. Um, so it was really about sort of um, uh, fine tuning that how we could uh, develop this engaging experience. I think one of the fascinating thing about this project was when I installed it in, in, in their headquarters in Germany, when there's multiple people in front of the piece, um, the shoe inside get confused to who um, the shoe should give the attention. So they start kind of getting confused and, and this already give it this level of um, uh, very much uh, animal-like characteristics. Um, so you have to sort of try to get closer to attract the attention of the piece. Um, and this really creates a, a playful, um, engaging experience for the, for the users. exploiting the notion of anthropomorphism, uh, but yet it does create a very engaging um, experience. 
Um, in a similar uh, uh, sort of line of work, um, I've been approached by Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago for um, uh, a piece for um, their um, fashion technology exhibition called Wire to Wear. And this piece called Iridescence. Iridescence is interactive color uh, equipped with a facial tracking camera with an array of 200 moving uh, quills or, or elements that they changes their color according to, um, according to information from the, from the um, people in front of the piece. Um, this piece um, is inspired by um, hummingbird feathers. Um, hummingbirds are amazing creatures. They can change the color of, color of their feathers from dark green to uh, pink magenta. And I've been really fascinated by this phenomenon. I've been thinking about ways that materials could change colors and change shape uh, in a similar fashion. For that, I decided with my team to develop um, a, a, a sort of actuation systems completely from scratch. And the reason for this was most mechanical systems are um, exposed to failure because um, they have a lot of gears and parts that they can break down. Um, yet we wanted to develop a system which is, doesn't have uh, so many components, it's just moving in one axis. This was a very big commission for my practice because not only it was um, acquired for the museum and for the permanent collection, but also this piece was um, a non-stop every day for one year on the show. And it was supposed to run 9 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. on daily basis. Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago has about one million and a half visitors, and it brings all people from all different types of ages. So it was very important to kind of come up with a system that it's robust enough, that it's durable, that we can provide a series of very clear instructions for the museum staff. So if something come up, if something breaks, they can easily replace um, the components. So uh, the production and fabrication of this piece, as you're seeing in the video, it was very iterative and hands-on to really fine tune all this information. But also we had to make sure that each of these components are assembled on a custom-made um, USB port. So let's say if one of the components, um, I'm going to bring the voice down. So uh, if one of the components doesn't work, they can, the staff from the museum can easily take it out and replace it with a new component. One of the special thing about this project was the fact that all components of it from hardware, from electric parts, from software, and every aspect of this piece and, and actuation systems was custom made. We made everything in house and um, that was both painful, but also extremely um, um, exciting to see as the project was coming together. So it's 250 uh, components that they move um, uh, and they changes their colors. It was extremely labor intensive in terms of uh, wiring all these components and all of these components were sort of embedded inside um, the piece. Um, these are um, some of the early interactions that you're seeing. So the piece has a camera that um, in a few seconds, you can see that um, the, what the camera sees, uh, how the camera sees the people around, it can detect the, the emotional expressions of the people and basically get average. So if it detects that people are surprised, uh, the piece also kind of like uh, have a surprise um, gesture. If it recognizes you're happy, it creates a ripple. And if it recognizes you're angry, it sort of tremble very, very fast as though it wanna sort of repel you from getting closer to the piece. Um, conceptually, this piece is really about um, uh, how if your eyes are closed or if you're um, uh, blind, uh, how could you sense your surrounding environments through different sensory uh, inputs? Um, through hearing where they are, people around you, or what kind of emotions they're expressing through your garment. You could um, experience the word and through different uh, sensory modalities. This is known as sensory substitution. And I'm really fascinated by this notion uh, of changing 
ways that we sense the world. I'm sorry, I just <laughs> remember one more thing about it. Um, so uh, the piece, as you're walking around the piece or as you're expressing different emotions, it triggers different type of behaviors. So you can, even if your eyes are closed, you know where people are standing um, compared to your body. And you know that what kind of emotions they're expressing through their facial expressions. last project that I would like to share is my latest project that I have um, developed during this pandemic. Actually, I was working on it before pandemic and then all of a sudden um, COVID hit, um, but um, it, it was um, exactly during the pandemic. So I, I was just in my studio and basically developing this project um, and finished it. Uh, this last project is very much um, personal and dear to me because it's inspired my, with my um, personal background. This project um, is um, called Can the Subaltern Speak? And I'm going to take you through the, 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 um, the idea behind this project. Um, Um, masks are fascinating and they have uh, so many different implications throughout the history, either um, in terms of like political aspects or historically, um, they have different roles and they've played um, different social and political roles throughout history. Um, uh, this mask, uh, this project is inspired by Iranian mask worn by Bandari women in southern parts of Iran. It's been said that um, these women, uh, they were wearing this mask um, as a way of under, under the Portuguese colonial rule as a way of protecting um, uh, the bearer or the women from um, master, master slave looking for pretty women. Obviously from contemporary perspective, this could be seen as oppression, as a, as a way of um, uh, uh, sort of oppression of women against patriarchy. Um, from the design point of view, I was really intrigued by the design of this mask. Um, this mask cover most of the face except the eye. And I've been thinking about how um, eyes could become uh, this um, communicative tool for communication. How um, if, especially if the face of these women were covered with this mask, how are they like, how are they going to express their, their emotions or how do they uh, communicate with one another? And during my research, I came across an interesting incident in which um, an American uh, soldier, um, Jeremy Denton, during America Vietnam War, um, and during this uh, video that they were, uh, they were making as a propaganda video, um, he managed to um, express the word torture through his eye blinking. Um, that was really fascinating for me. I was like really inspired by the fact that how could you use your eyes using Morse code for communicating an information or a secret message? Well, whatever the position of my government is, I believe in it. Yes, sir. I am a member of that. The use of code. For but, um, Actually, the, 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 the fact that use of code or secret message is nothing new. During this um, uh, uh, lockdown, we are seeing that in many countries, including Europe, um, a lot of women uh, use a secret code for asking help against domestic abuse. Um, so I've been really interested that how could we even think about language and code for communication? And I 
come across another research, um, the experimental research by Facebook AI lab, in which they, they um, their intention was to see how two robots can negotiate um, and they can communicate with one another, although they have conflicting interests. Um, this research was really interesting because um, the scientists, um, when they started doing this uh, experiments, that the robots started to learn from their own mistakes. Um, and after a while, they develop a language that started to, for instance, repeat words or uh, become really weird. And at some points, uh, so scientists decided to stop these experiments um, because it wasn't what they wanted to, to, to see. But uh, conceptually, this was inspiring for me because knowledge is a power and inability to decode those information or that knowledge would undermine the power of those who want to keep the authority or the power. So um, thinking about all these ideas, I wanna kind of take you through the design process of this project. Um, uh, the, the, the design of the mask um, is um, it's a 3D printed piece using um, SLA technology and the lines are mapped to um, Langer lines of the human um, facial skin uh, systems. Uh, Langer lines are the lines of the human skin, uh, either on the face or the body, that they're um, usually minimum tension lines and they're the lines that also inform our facial expressions. Um, and um, the piece is also, is it playing? Yes. Uh, the piece is also uh, populated with a um, series of electromagnetic um, actuators. It has 18 electromagnetic actuators that they can move in one axis. And each of the, the um, actuators are um, uh, sort of holding uh, uh, eyelashes. And it gives the illusion of 18 um, eyes are looking at the onlooker. Um, this project was also challenging in terms of uh, the control. Um, so as you can see here, I'm prototyping the different behaviors that uh, these um, uh, eyes could produce. Um, um, but also uh, this piece uh, has a custom made um, uh, proximity sensor, which is located above the eye of the wearer. And according to your openness or closeness of your eye, it can change the speed of this um, uh, information transmission. And um, similar to the previous project, again, the electrical part of the system um, all the electrical boards uh, was custom made. Um, so there's 18 microcontroller, um, three driver boards, of, um, one microcontroller, one proximity sensors, all embedded inside the systems. And, and the mask um, starts producing sentences. Um, these sentences are all generated using machine learning algorithms. Um, and um, that they were initially trained based on um, uh, the text by um, um, uh, SPVAC, um, and I'll get to that in a second. But basically, um, as you can read the sentences, some of them, they don't make fully make sense because they're not written by human. They're written by machine and by the algorithm called Markov chain. Markov chain is a machine learning algorithm that is for simulating aesthetically modeled random processes. And for instance, that what is the probability of uh, a sunny day after a full rainy day? Um, similarly, we use such a system for computing that what is the probability of every letter after another letter? And for the source, um, data of this work, I used Can the Subaltern Speak by critical uh, thinker Gayatri Spivak, who is a very famous feminist thinker. Uh, she really questioned um, that how, um, uh, I'm gonna just, uh, she really questions um, how um, a, a subaltern or a colonized could develop a voice under the oppression of um, the colonizer. And I thought that that was really fascinating article and um, I was very inspired by this work. So I used that as a source data for 
uh, producing a um, series of texts um, that could be communicated between these women. Uh, so similar to uh, the example that I mentioned earlier, um, this system compute what is the probability in the letter uh, scale, what is the probability of every given letter after the last three letters. Um, and uh, the system keep producing letters um, that it's trained by based on that uh, source data. This information, um, after it's produced, um, it will be sent to the microcontroller and the microcontroller translate this, um, each of the letters to a Morse code. So, um, and um, you can see here that um, each mask communicates with the next mask, sending the sentences after the, the, and they use the Bluetooth communication after the next Mac mask receives the information, then it process and send another. Um, uh, uh, it really looking at how we could, uh, how, how, how we could think about ways that um, a mask could produce a language for women to develop uh, a way for communication between women, um, a way that um, it's just developing a secret message uh, for communication that probably so anxiety inside to, to the patriarchy and question um, this type of oppression of women um, using um, uh, technology and machine learning algorithms. Um, so I'm going to um, show the, what this was, um, I think I showed these slides. Um, so I'm going to show the final video. The idea is, um, although it sounds speculative, but through training of such systems, after they communicate for years and years and use of such systems, they can develop a new type of language between women that um, it's perhaps um, could be developed among themselves and, and develop a new type of language that it's um, learned from a feminist um, Spielberg's um, article. Um, to kind of wrap up um, this presentation, um, as materials um, are equipped with various type of AI system, um, I would like to, or, or computational systems, I would like to think about ways that these systems could um, be a way for addressing larger psycho, social and political issues that matters. So that's why I'm really excited about possibility of working in this world of critical making to really address larger, larger issues. So it's less about sort of technology uh, for the sake of technology, uh, but really what, what, uh, what we could say or how, what are the things that we could address um, uh, using this type of technological systems. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Benaz. Um, that was fascinating. <laughs> um, so we would like to open up uh, the platform to any questions that you may have. Um, I, I certainly might have some questions of my own. <laughs> uh, 
but if you do have any questions, uh, you may raise your hands. We'll wait maybe a couple of seconds to see if any of you would like to do so. So raise your hands as in, oh, um, Nathan, could you explain <laughs> how to? Yes, um, so it may look a little different um, depending on, um, I don't know why it's different for some people, uh, but down below where you see um, participants, chat, um, possibly share screen um, and other things, there might be rea a reactions option and that is where you can find the option to raise hands. So if you hover over that option, you click on it, you'll see a bunch of emojis, but down below you might see raised hand our raise hand and that's where you can select that to um, and a little icon will pop up and Rachel will be able to um, call on you. The other place that we found where it's at um, is under participants list and if you go to your name, am I on the right track patients? I'm yes. trying to remember and make sure I'm telling this right. Yeah, you are. Um, that you may find uh, if you hover over your name and you click on the options to uh, be able to select um, raise hand there as well. Okay, wonderful. So, yep, Andrea, perfect. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you ever get like stuck. Did I unmute it? Yeah, okay, sorry. If you ever get like stuck, like thinking about like a new idea, or once you start like a new project, if you ever like can't figure something out, like if you just get stuck, and then how long does it take for you to like get back to work or to come up with a new idea? Yeah, good question. I mean, all the time, <laughs> honestly, all the time. Uh, I think um, sometimes it can be frustrating, um, but often uh, if you can um, accept that this is part of the process and enjoy that moment of not knowing what you do, I, I think it can, it can be interesting process itself. So a lot of times in my project, I'm not actually sure what I'm doing. A lot of times I might feel lost and I might feel like um, it's very uncertain. Um, uh, currently I'm working on projects that I feel like I'm constantly hitting the wall. I'm not really sure where it's going, um, but I also keep reminding myself that this is part of the process. Um, I'm also a big believer on process-based doing. Um, so a lot of time it's not about like, oh, I have this idea. I want to just exactly make that idea to happen. But a lot of times through just making and fine tuning and going back and forth, you're kind of, you know, sculpting an idea. Uh, it's less top down and more kind of bottom up way of doing. So you're not alone. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Hannah, you had a question? Um, yeah, I, so you talked about how you like took some computer classes or a programming class to like, uh, look into like how, or if like computers could emote and like you like came to the conclusion that like it can like simulate emotions. Um, did you, do you work with programmers to like make this or is it just mainly body architects and like that type of field? Yeah, so when I started doing this type of work, um, uh, and, and I would say that to all of you, if you're interested in type of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary type of work, when you start doing this type of work, um, you got to kind of gain some knowledge of doing aspects of it yourself. Um, so when I started doing this type of work, I wasn't really, I started learning a lot, like how you can make things, uh, how you can do it robotic and how you can do programming, how you could document your project. So I was the one, I was doing everything on my own. Um, but gradually as you build up projects, um, and that happened for me that after a few early projects that I did, I gradually attracted some uh, friends of mine's attention at the time that they weren't actually they were just very getting friends and they were like oh do you need help and and I, I gradually was um, so, sort of distributing this load to other people too so um, I think it's really important that if you are interested in doing interdisciplinary work to understand that landscape 
you might not become an expert in programming. You might not become an expert in, let's say, robotics, or let's say in uh, computational design, but um, you might you want to sort of gain some basic knowledge that you can start making the low resolution of your idea happen. And then when you make your low resolution idea to real, then people can see it, it's tangible. It's something that people can say that, oh, I, I, I uh, uh, like this idea. I wanna help you to make it better. Um, so that would happen naturally. I would say, um, yeah, that would be a good transition to expand um, to other fields. Awesome. Edgar? Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what brought you to uh, think of these ideas, like such as with the body language and the masks? Obviously, like there are uh, animal influences, but also the, the political and statement uh, aspects of it, because I know it can be quite frightening to bring up these issues. So if I understand your question correctly, there's two. Um, one is the emphasis on body, which is very dominant in my work. I think a lot of my work has to do with some aspects of body, um, either um, tracking uh, bodily movement or gesture or gaze. Um, and and, and um, it's that sort of underlying principle that I'm really fascinated by ways that we can um, read and decode those information. And when I say those information, those information could be contextualized in terms of the social setting, political settings, or uh, psychological settings. And I'm really interested in all aspects of it to some extent. Um, but I've been really inspired by um, few fields, including neuroscience, cognitive science, um, fields such as feminism. Um, and um, these, these fields, I, I try to invest in terms of readings. Um, and the more you read, the more you learn about these fields, you, the more as a designer, you start thinking that, how can I, how can I bring these ideas uh, to, to design? Um, for the last... Uh, few years I've been also really inspired by um, critical theory as a field um, and just kind of self-educating myself as an architect we never trained um, a sort of uh, what is critical theory but I've been really in interested to just self-educate myself and, and the more you read the more you realize that wow there's so much so many ideas that you can bring from those fields and sort of merge it to design um, so um, look out for things that interest you and dive deeper and try to sort of self-educate yourself. Either it's mm, philosophy, is it, it is robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, neuroscience. Um, and just as a hobby, you start to listening to talks and read books and, and uh, let those ideas um, sort of uh, leak into the way of thinking about design. Wonderful. Kyle? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to give us this talk tonight. This was really inspirational and in a lot of ways just seems like light years ahead of uh, anything that I'm thinking. You know, it's like I'm wanting to go into architecture and I'm thinking about building buildings and you're, you're, <laughs> you're someplace else, but uh, very, very cool. So thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions that came up, but I, I'll just ask one. Um, so with the with the shoe display uh, design that you had for Adidas, I was wondering if there's a way for uh, maybe maybe you ran into this problem or or maybe not. But I wonder how how can you separate the the observer's reaction to the shoe from their reaction to your design? Because I think if I looked at an Adidas shoe in one of your designed objects, I would react with like a sense of wonder and excitement, but it would have nothing to do with the shoe. It would be because this design is so interesting. Um, in a way, uh, thank you for the compliment. Um, but uh, in, the, in, in a way, when you're standing in the front of the piece, because um, 
the shoe inside start to rotate. Um, and actually, uh, in, in the video, I couldn't show the actual shoe because at the time that was a concept shoe. So we just put a like a mock up shoe to film it. Uh, because we couldn't show um, because it was something that it was completely um, uh, like we had to sign so many NDAs and we couldn't show it. So the shoe was really cool, actually. <laughs> and um, the shoe was uh, like because it was moving and the lighting inside the piece, you would actually pay attention a lot. And you're standing in front of that opening. Uh, so we didn't have so much problem of distraction of people to, around of the piece. It was more like actually drawing their attention to, to the shoe inside. Having said that, um, people who are looking from the other side of the piece, let's say they were from behind the piece or from the side of the piece, obviously they, they see something different because they were seeing just the lighting as a, as a um, until they get in front of the piece. But the movement of the shoe inside was so sort of direct and one-to-one -one that it was just, um, it was very, it was very engaging. It wasn't in a way I wouldn't say like, yeah, it was, but you're to back to maybe sort of in a, in a way to your question, um, maybe part of th that piece was the reactions that I was seeing when people were in front of my piece. Like a lot of time, there was this sense of like, you just see them and their face is like, either kind of like mouth open or like a smiling. That's mostly two, re two reactions that you see uh, in a lot of installation that I had um, in public. And I was thinking that that two, inter two expressions could be a way for seeing that how can you play with that like if something is like having no behaviors and if you can trigger something either surprise or happiness and how can you kind of build on that interaction okay thank you go ahead Selena. hi um I wanted to ask who you had as your assistants and like who was doing like the manual labor, like putting the little pieces together. I don't know. On which piece? Um, the, I mean, um, the one with the fibers where they had to stick each fiber into the piece. Yeah, so for the, the fiber piece, I had um, about six undergrad students, five undergrad students that they were coming. I had all of their names, um, but uh, they became friends and assistants and really um, excited to be part of it. And I was excited to get to know them. So it was actually a time that we were talking a lot while we were doing this. Um, Ryan and Kyla and all of their names are included in the, in the, in the website. Um, but um, yeah, it was, um, it was very labor intensive, but at the, si at the same time, it was a time to kind of like, uh, we we were we were just having time to also chat so it was kind of interesting social phenomenon and how many people do you have working with you like on average for all of your product like projects so um that varies um usually i i hire people uh, as i get a commission come in um especially in this pandemic right now everything is a little different because um everything is slightly slower and, and the commissions works are less and all of that. So I usually hire people as I get a big commission come in um, and typically four to five people, um, some part-time, some, some full-time um, that happened in the past. And according to projects that come in, I'll, I'll do that. And I put a call out, so so keep an eye. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Eureka. Yes, hello. Sorry, hi there. Hi, I'm Eureka, and I'm one of the faculty here. I have a question regarding the selection of your models for your body work. How do you go about selecting who presents your work, and what do you think that communicates to your audience? That's a very good question. I mean, a lot of time varies based on the project. Um, 
And sometimes um, it's, I mean, obviously I understand that it has sort of representation in terms of racial uh, also representation in every single single project. Um, having said that a lot of time also it has to do with um, the, the, uh, the, the aesthetic um, of the piece um, also. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in creating sort of um, an image that it's forward thinking and looking into the future and provides possibilities. Uh, um, also, um, for instance, in the last project, um, it was the first time that I was the model myself. So it was like, I put myself to be in front of the camera. So it's very much I'm aware of the performative aspects of being the model. So telling a story and narratives through the bodies, through the performance aspects that uh, what kind of a story I want to tell. Um, so for me, it really uh, come from that vision, I would say a lot of time after the project is finished, it's like, what is that vision? What am I gonna try to say? Or what is that a story? What is that narrative that I'm interested to say? Um, and then go on with selecting um, who, who I want to work with. So I'm, I, I'm to some extent selective about it. It's not just happen randomly uh, for every project. To some extent, it was very selective process. I actually go through like, you know, cast and like interviewing people and putting together a big team for just production. Um, and so it's very kind of carefully and, and partly is because I was also trained in cinema school at USC. So got familiar with like film crew people, just even kind of being naturally in that landscape, kind of like how they look at narrative and storytelling and, and casting and putting together a team and going on a set and all that become part of the, the, the issue. Um, but the more also my recent work, I would say, the more I'm more interested to explicitly address this. And that's why I think this latest project for me was so strong and powerful because it was the moment that it was the performance of myself in front of the camera. Um, from my own ethnicity and ethnical back background. So, yeah. Can I have a follow-up question, Rachel? Thank you for the answer. That That's very important. I think one has to always be careful about not stereotyping one's own sort of ethnicity background and others. But uh, I have another question. Um, there was at the beginning, there was a project where the ceiling started to move in front of and over the body, right? Have you ever thought, and if there are any students in the room who know me, they know where I'm coming from, is have you ever thought that those movements of the interior building surface could come from an environmental condition aspect and not only from a visual aspect of seeing the body and being in touch with the body but you know there's air there's humidity there are all these other conditions in the space and i'm i'm working with environmental systems and i've always dreamt of this interaction between and between the interior surfaces of a building and the body not only visual but you know temperature humidity and you know air movement and all these things. I I think I think it has a lot of potentials. I mean, so, so, like thinking about the sort of environmental aspects in terms of, as you articulate, uh, in terms of uh, temperature, wind, any environmental aspects. Um, my my work, uh, I'm I'm trying to address that interaction between human and the built environments, ranging from series of the scales. And, and um, having said that, so I want to also emphasize that it's less about sort of visual um, effect as such, but uh, if you think about uh, the sort of the uh, neurological or psychological aspects of the human, so it has a larger agenda. 
um, it's not those of related to environments. Um, having said that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in those areas. My work never has been addressed that, but I'm not uh, close to that possibilities. Because after all, a lot of these materials that I worked with, they change based on environmental aspects. You change the temperature, the smart material shrink and changes the size. So it is environmental information. Um, I'm using it as a way of interaction with human, but um, yet um, maybe uh, for future type of exploration would be something that I would look into it more as well. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, I had a question as well. Um, so you talked about like self-education and kind of exploring the like various like disciplinary aspects of what your projects like involve. How do you kind of go about navigating um, what you like put your times towards in terms of like educating? I often find myself kind of have like information overload and not know where to focus my time and what to uh, like direct my attention towards and like where I need to draw on other people to like help me assist with that. Um, so I was just kind of wondering like how you manage and balance what information you obtain yourself. That's also a really good question, actually. I think it's it's difficult task uh, to know what is your interest even. Um, I think that's a little also the journey to self-discovery. Like you need to kind of connect to your true self to see what interests you, what makes you excited, what makes you... Um, th there is... Um, I'm, I'm kind of believer in intuition. There is something inside you that push you in certain direction. So like hearing to that voice, hearing to that sort of inner voice that tell you like, oh, I'm interested in this, no matter what my friends, my peers, my teachers are telling me, I'm interested in this. So I think if you can kind of like um, connect to yourself and see what is it that kind of interests you what is it that makes you excited? Um, and there might be a lot of different things, but um, there is one of them or two of them that you just kind of, no matter what, you're kind of attracted to do that, that thing more. So just go explore it. And don't, when you are exploring it, don't question yourself. Because the worst thing I think is when you are interested in a topic and you go in and you just give up because you're like, oh, I just get attracted to another idea but like leave something halfway done. That's the worst thing. You wanna, when, when you lead, lead with conviction, just keep going to the direction that you wanna go. Perfect, and I'm gonna pass it over to Patience to read um, Jonathan's question. Okay, this is from John, Jonathan Zepeda. I would, I like what you said about low resolution, resolution ideas and how they can grow. Did you develop this way of thinking from your time in architecture school? And as far as materials, what challenges do you think we have to overcome to be able to integrate these types of systems to entire building envelopes? Have you tried doing this? And then kind of a follow up, would you be willing to share your portfolio from undergrad or grad? We are in our senior year of our BARC at the University of Wisconsin. Amazing work, very inspiring. Well, thank you for, that's many different questions in one. So I'll try to remember, I, I see what I remember. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of, uh, uh, maybe I answered the one that I'm excited to first and then I'll try to answer all of them. In terms of uh, sort of expanding this idea to um, to architecture and have I ever managed to actually use it in architectural scale, I think there is the question of scalability, like to what extent we can actually make these ideas in a larger scale. Um, there is also the issue of funding. Um, uh, the architectural project requires a larger funding and it requires lar longer um, time in terms of the span of the project. Um, uh, and, and on the other hand, object or variable size projects, they can be handled way faster with a smaller budget. So there is that aspect very pragmatically, there is that aspect that I found it a little um, 
frustrating. Having said that, I'm extremely excited to actually do that. And, and I'm, I'm really interested um, uh, to move toward a public art type of installation in which this type of systems can aggregate in architectural and urban scale. Uh, so I'm actively working on seeing that if that would open up as a, as a pathway to explore, because I'm really interested in really crossing these scales to, to larger. Um, and I really believe that this type of system could provide very um, sort of impactful way for engaging with public um, and citizens in the, in, the, in, in the city as well. Um, and Yet, I also want to add that, yes, the material and material um, uh, limitations are one of the questions. So that's why we see a lot of public installation in terms of immersive projection mappings. They're successful because they don't break. They're, they're, um, they're, they're digital. Um, they're not dealing with wear and tear of the material. Um, Having said that, I'm really interested to see how these two words of physical and digital could be sort of blared into one. Um, in terms of the resolution, um, you point out something that I never knew. I, I don't know. I just kind of thought about it. Uh, uh, maybe I have heard it in architecture education, but it was very much something that it wasn't explicit. So even if it was in architecture education, it somehow was internalized in me. I just noticed it in my own work that um, as things, I, I guess it's sort of also reflect about human cognition. Like we, we perceive the world from like kind of low res and we add information to it. Um, we perceive any entity around ourselves that that's, that's a way that human perceive. Um, so I think as designers, we also go from low res image or vision to more like a higher res um, resolution vision. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered everything, but um, there my, yeah, my also the in terms of the portfolio, my portfolio of my undergrad is probably very different. It's very much architectural, um, uh, building, um, I have to find it, but yeah, I, sh I can, I can share that. Okay, thank you. We, we have, wow, filled up the time beautifully. And um, I think that, sh that should be the last question as we need to start wrapping up. So thank you very much, all of you for engaging. This was amazing. Um, I would like to thank um, the Lectures and Exhibits Committee for making this happen as well. Um, and you know, for all of you just uh, participating and showing up, but thank you very much uh, Benaz for, for, not, for being here and sharing your expertise with us. This. Um, uh, is quite inspiring. And um, on behalf, I, I'm assuming that if we could all unmute, we would, you know, give you a big, you know, um, ovation. And so, you know, just thank you so, so much. And so do you have any other little last things that you would love to share? You know, something that you, you, you it's in the back of your mind or burning in your heart <laughs> to share with us. No, thank you very much for having me. I, I, I had a great time. Um, I was really hoping to be present with all of you in the same space. I really hope that that happened one day in future. But uh, for now, keep up the good work and continue the, the good, good work. <laughs>